Hi, everyone. Um, I want to thank you so much for coming out today's Authors at Google event with Bill Murphy, Jr. Um, I just had a quick a uh, few announcements before I'm going to let Pete give uh, a proper introduction here. Um, but just as a reminder, um, please use the microphone right over here for any questions so we can capture it for our YouTube and video conference audience. And um, mostly just uh, enjoy. So thanks so much for coming out. Right. Hello, everybody. I'm uh, Pete Ritchie. I'm a team lead uh, with AdWords here at Google. And uh, before I begin, I just wanted to thank the Google authors and uh, specifically Lisa McIntyre, who just introduced me, um, for helping make this a uh, really great event. And uh, I wanted to thank the Google veterans and other veterans that are here um, for supporting this event. And then finally, I want to thank Bill, um, the author of In a Time of War, for writing this amazing book and coming to Google to discuss it with us. So I'm, I'm really honored to introduce Bill. Um, and I'll give you a little bit about his background and a little bio and then a little bit about my connection to this book and why I thought it was so important uh, for Google to hear about it and Bill to discuss it. Um, so Bill was born in New York City. He grew up in Rhode Island. Uh, medical issues kept him out of the Navy and Marine Corps and he began a career as a newspaper reporter in New Haven after college. Working for two years at the New Haven Reg uh, Register, after that he then went to law school at the University of Connecticut. Afterward he, afterward, he tried civil cases as an attorney for the U.S. Department of Justice based in Washington, D.C. Bill joined the Army Reserve while at the DOJ and was called up twice for active duty as a JAG officer, first at Fort Drum, New York, and later with the U.S. Army Legal Service, Services Agency in Virginia. After le leaving after active duty, he went to work as a research and reporting assistant to Bob Woodward at the Washington Post. Working mainly on the 2006 bestseller, State of Denial, he also reported from Iraq for the Post and was a military embed in early 2007. In writing In a Time of War, his book about West Point's class of 2002, Bill conducted more than 600 interviews and traveled across the United States and to Iraq. The book has been described in reviews as inspiring and heartbreaking, powerful, skillfully written and moving, and astonishingly, astonishingly well written and compelling. My personal connection to this book is I'm a proud member of the class of 2002. Additionally, the book was written specifically about my particular company at West Point, company D1, the Ducks. A company, and I'll explain a little bit about a company, I don't want to go too much into what Bill's talking about, but a company, there's 48 companies at West Point, and it is comprised of freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors, and that is pretty much where the leadership hierarchy mirrors the Army. So that's where a lot of West Point cadets get their leadership training is through leading each other. Um, I know that Bill did extensive research on this book. And you know, as I mentioned before, he did over 600 interviews. But how I know that he really did his research was, and, and that the book was so well, written, well, so well written, was that it brought back many of the same feelings I had through, um, during my time while I was in the Army. <clears throat> Bill was able to create the sinking and unnerving feeling of being in a combat zone with an enemy sniper in the area. The feeling of absolute sadness when you have to say goodbye to the most important person in your life and not know if you're ever going to see him again. The feeling of complete and utter loss when your friend is killed in an ambush. The feeling of guilt when one of your soldiers under your command is killed by an improvised explosive device. Bill's book is able to create a lump in your throat the same lump I had when I arrived home for my first deployment in Iraq and people were already talking about going back for a second time. Additionally, Bill does such an excellent job of capturing the personalities and characters of Tim Mosier and Todd Bryant. These were two ducks that were in my company that were killed in action and are featured in this book. Todd and I were both from Southern California and went to the Armor Officer Basic course together in 2002. Tim and I were platoon leaders as seniors at West Point. So we have a personal connection, and, and we've, we were at West Point for four years together, which is not normal. Normally, after two years at West Point, you then scramble companies. But this particular class happened to stay together for all four years. They were truly fine men, and Bill does a great job of portraying the realities of war on the soldier, the family, and their friends. The motto of the class of 2002 
is pride in all we do. It is a motto that is chosen by the class at the beginning of its freshman year. Tim and Todd live this motto to their last breath. I am proud of Tim and Todd. I am proud of the class of 2002. And I'm proud of Bill for writing this book about sacrifice and service in a time of war. Thank you. You can hear me as I walk around, right? Okay. I won't mutter under my breath. I'm, I'm Bill Murphy, and I want to thank you all for uh, having me here. Especially thanks for, to Pete, who I met before he was at Google, obviously, uh, in researching his book, and Google authors, um, and all of you for taking your time to be here today. Uh, what I'd like to do is I'm going to talk about the book and some of the themes and things that I've learned and that I talk about, um, but I'd like to just show you a three-minute video uh, that we did. It'll introduce you to a couple of characters and um, maybe kind of set some tone for us. So I'll just do that real quick. If you just tell us who you are, your ranks, and, and name, and where you're from. Uh, second Lieutenant Todd Bryant. Have you guys ever, ever been in an ambush with small arms fire? <laughs> the, I assume the laugh means a lot. I know. First to fight for the right and build the nation's might and the army goes rolling along. Proud of all we've done, fighting to the battles won, and the army goes rolling along. There it is, high, high, hey, the army's on its way. Count on the kings now to destroy, because wherever we go, you will always know that the army goes rolling along. Your last year, America was attacked by a ruthless and resourceful enemy. You graduate from this academy in a time of war. Valley Forge, Justice Franks, and one hell of Pat's tanks, and the army keeps rolling along. Men and pounds from the star. Thank you for watching it. Um, uh, quick background, that video, I know it's who does a music video for a book, right? But the reason we did that is because the theme of this book over and over for me as I reported it, as I researched it, as I wrote it, was just to drive home how the one and a half million Americans who served in Iraq and Afghanistan are you know, real people, that, they're, that they are, um, they're not all that different from those who haven't, except for a few specific choices they've made in their lives. And so it's, you know, I know there's a little bit of Iraq footage and, and stock photos, but I really wanted us to grab some of these pictures of people being people. So um, let me just tell you a little bit about myself, how the book came about, and then the themes. So um, as Pete said, uh, I worked for Bob Woodward of the Washington Post as his research assistant on a 2006 book called State of Denial. And In a Time of War was actually born as a footnote in a memo that I wrote to Bob. Um, the reason for this was this very early on, I was actually trying to get the job with Bob. And I had read Bob's previous book, which is called Plan of Attack, about President Bush's decision to go to war in Iraq. Well, that speech that you saw a little clip of, President Bush at their graduation, that's what I focused on. Because that's the speech where President Bush, June 1st, 2002, nine months after 9-11, pretty much announced 
the restructuring of American foreign policy, where we got rid of the containment doctrine that we'd had, where we, um, you know, as long as the Soviets stayed in their box and we stayed in our box, we weren't going to uh, go to war with each other. And we switched to a preemption doctrine, which basically said, we, we reserve the right and we make it our policy to take military action against other countries before their threats against us have fully materialized. Well, I knew from reading Woodward's book and later things I found out that Bush's speechwriters, they thought this was the equivalent of Winston Churchill's Iron Curtain speech, like that big a deal. And I thought, well, that's really interesting because Churchill, of course, gave the Iron Curtain speech at Westminster College in Missouri, sort of small college. But Bush chooses to give this speech where he all but declares war to the brand new youngest lieutenants in the United States Army. So in other words, the people who actually go out and do the fighting. And you know, at this time, I had a brother who was a Marine infantry officer, and I had been an Army JAG officer. And I just, for some reason, I just focused on and identified with all these 1,000 young men and women in, in the audience. You know, 9-11 happened in their senior year, the world changes, and then this speech, this moment. And I t said to Bob in this footnote, you know, if you hire me, um, one of the things we should do is we should track them all down. We should see what happened to them and see if we can sort of write a DC policy story and uh, a young lieutenant story. So I got the job and I worked for Woodward on state of denial. And um, for a variety of reasons, this sort of young lieutenant's part of the project kind of fell to the side. But I'd already, I already dive, dove into it, dived into it, dove into it. I was already very deep into it. And uh, I really just kind of loved the story. And I was meeting these people and they were opening up to me and talking to me. And I really just, I was hearing these really rich human stories over and over. And I thought, nobody's really telling these. You know, a lot of reporters get to interview soldiers, but it's, it's not for three hours, you know, on background for a book that'll come out three years later. So there's not that opportunity necessarily to develop trust and for people to speak freely. So, so. So anyway, so I was doing this the entire time I was working for Bob Woodward on State of Denial. This was my nights and my weekends. And there were a lot of, you know, leave Woodward's office on a Friday night, go to the airport, fly to Fort Benning, Georgia, do interviews all weekend, fly back to Washington, D.C., go to work on Monday morning and sort of, you know, good morning, Bob, good morning, Bill, how was your weekend? Oh, you know, unusual. Um, so I just want to tell you just a little bit more about the background. As, as Pete said, you know, 600 interviews, that's a lot of interviews. Uh, and in a way, this is one of those projects that uh, if I'd known how impossible it was, I wouldn't have been able to do it, right? Um, and I tell you that, though, not to sort of, you know, build myself up as, uh, uh, but to give you a little bit of reservoir of credibility for some of the conclusions I'm going to tell you I came to about how these people feel. Um, interesting thing, I mean, some of these people that I wrote about were Pete's friends that he went to school with. But I found that getting to know them that well, I, I actually knew some of them better than their own friends knew them, just because of the opportunities we had to talk. And one question I was constantly asking myself, frankly, was why? Why are they opening up to me like this? So I just want to kind of um, leave that question hanging out there, and we're going to try to answer that over the course of this. So uh, as I say, a few points. Uh, 300 million Americans, and statistics are hard to come by, but between one and a half and 1.7 million veterans of the Iraq and Afghanistan wars, which means about a half percent of Americans have actually uh, been in combat in these wars. Uh, 30,000 wounded, give or take, about 4,800 killed. And, um, but because you know, we're talking about a half percent, that was the major theme I wanted to drive home was introduce the vast majority of us who never had to go to combat to a few of the people that actually choose to do it and go back and go back and go back. So, a, In a Time of War is first and foremost a book about people. And that's part of why I wanted to show that video in the beginning. And I'd like to, you know, um, to tell you just very briefly about four of the characters in the book that I got to know really well. Um, and I'm going to keep it brief because it's not really quite in context here and also because I want to whet your appetite to want to know more, right? Um, but the, as, as Pete said, I wound up focusing on this group called the Ducks, Company D1. And it's interesting how I came to that. When I started this, I wanted to be statistically valid. I wanted to take this class of 1,000 people, and at the end of the book, I wanted you to say, oh, well, you know, a third of these people stayed in the Army. Well, I guess overall a third stayed in the Army. You know? um, it didn't quite work out that way, and in part it was because, well, A, it was impossible to do, and B, uh, because I just 
found the story of these particular people so compelling that I had to, to stick with it and tell their story very well. And you know, people are adults that read the book. They can understand that it's not always going to be uh, a, an exact uh, engineering diagram of everybody's experience overall. Um, but at one point, I was following 24 people very closely, which means contacting them every couple of weeks at least, phone calls, long emails. That's a fair number of people to keep track on their lives and not just try to do you know, what, what it's like in combat, but you know, are you still dating that girl? Should I be writing her into the book? Is she going to be in it at the end? That type of thing. Um, so I'm going to tell you real briefly about four of them. The first is a guy named Will Tucker. And it's OK to say Pete, just meant, Pete knows Will Tucker. Um, Will is kind of the person I thought I was going to meet at the beginning of this project. And by that, I mean, you know, I've been in the Army, but I'd never even been to West Point when I started this book. And I had some preconceptions about West Point. And one of them was you know, sort of tough, taciturn, you know, John Wayne style officers, right? Well, Will is sort of that way. Very quiet guy, southern, rural, um, combat arms officer. And the other thing I thought was that he, I mean, he personifies a sort of perfect timing notion of this class of 2002. Because I think for a generation, you know, you go through and, and they get told over and over again that you're, you, when you're young lieutenants, the pinnacle of leadership in the world is to be an American officer leading troops in combat. I think that's an underlying message at West Point. But there was an entire generation that went through West Point, and very few of them actually served in combat, which is a good thing because it means we didn't have many wars. But now you've got this class that graduated, and almost all of them did it. And they did it over and over and over again. So Will is the perfect example. Three combat tours, um, you know, medals and decorations and that sort of thing. But he saw the good, the bad, and the ugly of combat and men under fire. Um, the second person of the four that I'd like to mention to you, you see her in the, in the video very quickly, is a woman named Trisha LaRue Birdsell. And Trisha was interesting to me. I, I kind of wanted to have a woman to follow in the book. I didn't want to do a quota, but I thought that's 10% of the story here. It's important. And one thing interesting about Trisha is that, like many West Pointers, she comes from a military family. But in her case, she was actually the daughter of a mother who was an army officer. So you had a mom passing it on to her daughter and not not the father. And I thought, well, that's indication. This is a little bit different. It's not your father's West Point, so to speak. Um, and she married a classmate, and they were in Iraq together, not very far from each other, but for a year, you know, 15 minutes away if you could drive, but you wouldn't really want to do that more than you had to, right? Um, so it was interesting to me that they were actually 15 minutes away from each other, but only one of them would have email. So they, um, they went old school and sent letters back, to, back and forth to each other. Uh, you know, postmark sent down to Baghdad and then right back up 15 minutes away from each other. And uh, Trisha actually is one of the people in the book that decides to stay in the Army and make it a career. And I forgot to mention, Pete actually ran into Will at the airport in New Orleans, so he's out and safe and sound now. Um, and Trisha, I just happened to talk to um, just before I came here today, and she's down in, uh, in Virginia at an Army base um, training and raising a family. So uh, the third is the guy, Todd Bryant, that you saw right in the beginning there. Um, and Todd, in a lot of ways, kind of became you know, the soldier of the war for me, so to speak. Um, Todd, he's really a wonderful person to write about because Ali was a, a very excellent leader, and I know that because I talked to basically, you know, nearly every soldier who served under him. And here we are, we're actually five years after Todd's death, and some of his soldiers from back then, at least one I can think of, has actually recently named a child after him. He, you know, that's, that's, that stays with you. But the thing I liked about Todd is that um, while he comes from a military family, the son of Air Force officers, a brother in the Marines, a sister ahead of him at West Point. Uh, there's, there are other sides to his personality as well. Very funny guy. Uh, he was from California. Loved California. Talked about it nonstop, how great California, California was, how lesser every other place in America was. Um, if you were to go to his grave at Arlington National Cemetery on certain days, um, and I know this because I've done it myself now too, every time I come to California now, I have to go to In-N-Out Burger and uh, pick up ketchup packets or little salt packets and leave them on his grave at Arlington. That was, but I just love the idea of an army officer who's obsessed with In-N-Out, OK? <laughs> and um, so anyway, so, so Todd sort of became the, uh, the soldier of the war for me. Now, as you've seen, he was killed in Iraq. Um, actually, only 10, he went to Iraq 10 days after he was married and was killed only five weeks after he got there. So the war was over very quickly for him. Um, but uh, just a little aside, the title of the book, In a Time of War, obviously comes from Bush's speech. But it also comes from me, it comes from, um, I mean, I was looking forever for a title, trying to find it. And it was Todd's widow 
who talked about being there in the audience, hearing that speech that day, and it was that moment when the president said, you graduate from this academy in a time of war, and she said, it's like all of a sudden she realized that the army, the West Point army with you know, dress uniforms and parades and dances and things is the same army as the one with these people who are going to war. You know, it's an obvious thing, but you can imagine how it didn't quite internalize for her until that exact moment. I thought, wow, the President of the United States says it, and you, you know, you're right there and you get it. Um, overall, I think the story of the ducks is a story of resilience and sacrifice and service. And I was kind of drawn to this. I knew Todd had died, but one reason I focused on them early on was I thought, well, these are close friends who very early on lose a friend, but they still have five years to serve. And how do you carry that? How do you do that? How do you, you know, you know, you can't tell your parents, don't worry, nothing will ever happen. You've, you've seen it can happen. And how do you get up and go ahead and do it anyway? And sometimes, like I say, two and three times. Um, in part because it's a great story and in part because I didn't want just to focus on this group in which people didn't always survive, I, I wove other stories into it. And I'm just going to mention one other person, um, Drew Sloan, who you also saw in the video. Um, Drew was kind of the atypical West Pointer in a way, because there's no military tradition in his family. And he talked to me about how he'd never heard of West Point until he read a Tom Clancy book in which one of the main characters had gone to West Point. Um, and he sort of lived a charmed life, he would say. He was a very smart guy, infantry officer. He bought into West Point and wanted to, wanted to go to combat. But um, you know, wound up stationed in Hawaii, right? Rough life. Um, invested in real estate smartly and made a lot more from real estate investments than his army salary while he was in. Um, and, but everything changed for him. October 10th, 2004, when he was wounded in Afghanistan, very badly. Um, significant facial injuries. Every single bone in his face was broken and um, wound up, you know, woke up four days later at Walter Reed and faced a year of reconstructive surgeries. The president visits him, they give him the Purple Heart and they say, you've given everything you have to give for your country Here's your medical discharge. You can go about your life. And he turns it down and says, no, 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 I'm not getting out. And goes through the surgeries and recovers well enough to go to Iraq for an entire year, uh, which is actually, ironically, the first place I ever met him in person was in Iraq after talking with him on the phone for two and a half years. Um, so we get back to, again, this, the question, why? You know, why do they talk to me? Why do they serve? Why did they stay in? So it's interesting, when you write a book, this is the first book I've ever done, so I'd never been through this before. And you write a book, and at the end, you, know, you do interviews, and people say, well, tell us what the book is about. And you should be able to do this, right? You should be able to say in you know, 20 seconds, we're in an elevator. But it took me a while to figure out what the book was about, you know, three years of work into 20 minutes. And you know, it's, about, uh, it's about this generation. I guess you guys are technically millennials, right? Uh, maybe you're a little bit older than that, but this generation, the new generation of army officers, it's about war, of course, it's about family. Um, but it was also about something that was so fundamental that it really kind of knocked me on my butt when I figured this out. I'm going to hold off, I'm going to explain you just a conversation I had. I was down another time at Fort Benning, Georgia, and I go out to dinner with this guy as a 1999 West Point grad. And we're talking about all the themes that I'd heard over and over, you know. He's been to Iraq twice, and He's seen a lot of death and destruction, and he had a hard time you know, dealing with actually being the guy to give the order to pull the trigger and end other people's lives. And you know, how do you balance that, your own morality and war, and, and, uh, and how hard it was for his wife and kids back home, and not one tour, but two. And then it occurs to me in this conversation that he's actually taken some steps in the Army that pretty much mean he's going to be in for a full 20 years. I'm like, so I'm really trying to figure this out. I say, so you know, I understand your pride, but why do you stay in? Why do you stay in? He sits back and he says, you know why? because I love Joe. Now, Joe is officer slang for enlisted soldiers. And it's usually not, you know, it's, it's not flattering to call, to, you, often to say Joe. It's usually, you know, what mess did Joe get in that I've got to clean up, that sort of thing. And he said, but it was actually in combat, second time around, that I realized I love Joe and I can't imagine doing anything else. So I think about this a little while. And uh, everybody knows what a word cloud is, right? Okay. This is great. I can, I can do this at Google. Most other places, I ask that question, then I have to explain what a word cloud is. But I took the entire um, Microsoft Word document of uh, In a Time of War, and I put it in a word cloud generator. And I got all these pretty pictures of some of the words I expected, you know, war, Iraq, names of some of my characters. But one word that was really large was love. And this is what the book is about. At its core, In a Time of War is a book about love. So. You know, they don't always use that word, but I think I figured this out and I cracked their code. 
and they talk about patriotism, how much they love their country, they talk about um, how much they love their soldiers, and I thought about this, and I think of someone like Todd Bryant. The day he died, he knew exactly that it was, not that being in Iraq was, difficult, was dangerous, or he knew the exact mission he was going on was especially dangerous, that they'd been hit by IEDs and those other places. But if his soldiers are gonna be sent in that, he goes with his soldiers and he leads them. Um, I think of another guy. Did you know Joe De Silva? Yeah. yeah, Joe De Silva, class president, the class of 2002. Young guy, and he winds up getting to his unit just before the invasion of Iraq. I mean, he gets to his battalion in Iraq, and a day or two before the invasion, they say, by the way, you now have a platoon. So he's 23, he's never done anything, you know, and he's in, in charge of men and he's gonna lead into combat the next day. And of course, they're scared to death, you know, not, just, not about combat so much, but about this new lieutenant who might get them killed. And what does he say to them the first day? He says, I don't know what awaits us on the other side of that berm, but I'll tell you this, if I have to give my life for any of you, I will do it in a heartbeat. And you know, you could, is that sort of just talking? I don't think so, because I went back and I interviewed his soldiers, and they said, you know, up until that moment, it was fairly likely we were gonna tie him up and throw him in the back of the Humvee and worry about it when the war was over. But you know, you hear that from him and you say, okay, well, he's, he gets us, he's with us. Now, fortunately, Joe survived that tour, and he survived another tour, and he's actually just now wrapping up his third tour in Iraq. And this is a guy who thought about getting out, I know, because I talked to him, I got to know him, but he stayed in, and he's, it's, it's unusual, but he's with the same soldiers now, five and a half years later, that he promised that day that he would give his life for them if he had to. So, if the book and the story is about love, one question that I kept coming back to is, all right, so we've got this small percentage serving like this, and the best of them anyway, I think this word love comes up over and over, how does that relate to the rest of us? You know, me, who's not in the army anymore, um, civilians in general. And in thinking about this, I, I said the question is really, people say, well, I support the troops. I wanna know what should that really mean? And I sat down and someone asked me to write an article about this. And I, you know, I took a stab at it, another stab, another stab. And I thought, I'm a fool. What I should do is I should take the email addresses of the 400 or 500 army officers I have and ask them what I should write in the article. So I did that. And I got some great responses. I got some that were kind of funny. Uh, I learned that yellow ribbons on the back of an SUV were not high on their list of how to support the troops. <laughs> um, I heard a lot of other things, though. And I think I can boil it down to three sort of Murphy's maxims of effectively supporting the troops, is what I've taken to calling them. Um, the first is this, it's that I heard over and over that they want civilians just to find a way to serve their country, same as they do. They say that's part of the deal, that's why I agree to go off and risk getting killed and the like, you know, not make as much money as I could, be away from my family, it's because I'm serving the country and I hope that other people will find a way to do it as well. Um, and they understand we don't need 10 million soldiers, maybe we need a few more than we have now, but we don't need millions. But we need millions of people who are willing to serve their country in other ways. And I define that very broadly, and I think when you really talk with these people, they do as well. You know, because we don't often go around to nurses and teachers or innovators and inventors saying thank you for your service. But done for the right reasons, that's exactly what it is. It's exactly what it is. Um, I'm going to skip that. <laughs> the second thing is that they want Americans to exercise their rights. And I think actually that, um, you know, I wrote this article just before the election, but looking back on it, I think they would, by and large, be, even if they weren't Obama supporters, I think they would generally be pretty excited about the notion of you know, unprecedented numbers of people voting, of the intensity on both sides over this election. Um, they would want people to speak out. They would want people to, you know, stay informed and vote. And I think not just because it makes them feel good, but because they're kind of counting on it. When you join the Army <clears throat> or any of the services, you agree to put certain limitations on your own rights. You know, you can, you can speak out only in certain circumstances. Even other things like who can you marry? Where will you live? What will you do for work? You know, you agree to put those aside. And I think they're hoping that the rest of us have their backs and that we'll ask tough questions. And not that we'll support whatever mission they're sent on, but that we'll work to ensure that, they'll sent, that they are sent on missions that we and they, by extension, can support. And I think they're asking me this. Todd Bryant, you know, um, probably wouldn't have been an Obama supporter politically 
But um, he used to use this quote all the time. And he thought it was Voltaire. I'm not sure it's Voltaire, but we'll say it's Voltaire. Uh, you know, I disapprove of what you say, but I will defend to the death your right to say it. I think that sums it up, what I heard over and over and over. OK, the final, most important, if you remember only one, it's this. It's pay attention to the troops. I think um, you know, a year and a half ago, yeah, it was a year and a half ago, I think a lot of us were kind of embarrassed to hear about how some of our wounded warriors were being treated at Walter Reed Army Medical Center. And when I talk about this, I raise this first, because this is a, a time where I can kind of point to myself, because I live about four miles from Walter Reed. And I think to myself, <clears throat> if a lawyer, former Army JAG, who's the assistant to Bob Woodward at the Washington Post, is not in a good position to kind of scream bloody murder and pay attention to what's going on, then I don't know who else is. But that's not the only example. You know, um, here, I feel bad for the guy who made this decision because it was this week, and this is what's kind of boiled my blood a bit this week. But we heard this week about a, um, a decision in Iraq to ban interpreters from wearing masks when they're out with American soldiers. Now, this is important because interpreters are probably putting their lives at risk more than Americans because their families are at risk. You know, just being identified, it's almost a death warrant. And because we want, I don't know what, uniformity, nice uniforms, uh, we've, um, we've issued an order in Baghdad that says they cannot wear these, um, these masks anymore. What's this going to do? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm not a military uh, genius, but I don't have to be because I've listened to the other soldiers I've heard this from. This will get some interpreters killed. Some of them will quit. This will get some American soldiers killed. You know, if I'm wrong, that's great, but I'd love to hear, and I, I think I do hear this, you know, people on the outside saying, you know, we've got your backs. When we see something like this, we're going to say something about it. You know, um, these are actually pretty, since the time I started giving this talk, I've thought of more and more really positive examples, actually, of Americans paying attention. But I think we had kind of a drought. I think if you think back to 9-11, right afterwards, Americans were kind of clamoring for a way to pay attention, to be involved. And, you know, this isn't just me talking. This is these soldiers I heard from. They understand that most Americans were pretty much told, thanks, but no thanks. We, meaning the professionals, have it covered. Um, and instead, we were told things like, live your lives, hug your children, fly and enjoy America's great destination spots, and get down to Disney World in Florida. And this is easy, these are easy targets in retrospect, and that you can make an argument that if we're going to fight a war against terror, then even paying attention to the terrorists gives them a victory. I understand that. But you know, there is a cost, and it's a cost not just in treasure and efficiency. I think it's a cost at the soul, a cost to the soul of the nation. So, you know, all of this said, as I get towards the end of this, what what I think is, is some of the, the best reason for hope that I've seen is Exhibit A as a former DOJ attorney, right? Exhibit A are the 600 interviews and the 200 plus people that I got to know as a result of writing this book because they are products of our society, like everybody, everybody here. Um, and they've stepped up and served, and I know that many of us are as well, but I sometimes think we just aren't communicating it correctly back and forth. There's just a big gulf between the military world and the civilian world, but the more you pay attention to it, the more the Gulf somewhat disappears. Bottom line, when we ask young men and women to join the military and go overseas and risk their lives and serve, I feel like, I know they feel like we're making a commitment that we've got their backs, that you know, when they go abroad, we'll pay attention to what's happening to them. And I think more important, most important, the number one reason that we need to do that is that if we don't it's almost like we've made fools of them, sent them off on a dangerous mission, and then stopped paying attention. And what's worse to me, when we have a population that's doing this because of love, is that we risk breaking their hearts. So that's why I wrote the book. I'd be happy to take any questions. Hello, thanks for coming. Um, so some would argue there's a tenuous link between September 11th and uh, toppling Saddam Hussein. I'm wondering how much that uh, troubled the people that you talked to. I, um, the question was if, if people in here, was, uh, some would say, many would say, there was a tenuous link between 9-11 and toppling Saddam Hussein. And the question was, what was the reaction of the people 
that I said to that. I think the, the, the answer to that is that it changed over time. I think right after 9-11, the, the people I got to know who were at West Point, they were psyched. They were, you know, not eager for war, let's say, but if there's going to be a war, they were kind of glad that they were the ones who were going to be leading the troops. And then, like much of the country, and you think back to then, I mean, there was, it certainly wasn't unanimous, there were huge demonstrations, but there was a lot of public support for invasion of Iraq. And they were, they were right there with it. Now, over time, in retrospect, I, I, hear, I, hear very, I hear very few people, not none, but I hear, hear very few of them in that class actually going back and saying, unambiguously, invading Iraq was the right thing to do. I hear a lot more of, you know, there's no such thing as uninvading the country, so we need to deal with it going forward. So, um, yeah, I mean, at the time, I think it was fairly gung-ho, and I think over time, it's become more mellow, absolutely. Um, So great talk, thank you. Um, so I'm a, I'm a big believer in the idea that supporting our troops means bringing them home safely. And I'm curious, I think most people that want to bring them back right away probably agree with me. And they you know, are, are big fans of the troops, it's just a matter of they don't necessarily agree with the war. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if you felt this message was conveyed on that end, that the people that are not necessarily for the war still actually do support the troops. Did you, did you feel that that sentiment was conveyed? Um, you know, was it conveyed? I, maybe, uh, you know, was it received and appreciated and for, for that sentiment? And I think um, mixed, mixed bag. I think there were some, you know, there are anti-war activists, I don't know about activists, but there, there are people with strong anti-war views in this class who are actually serving in the war over and over, who'd be right with you and say, actually, what I would want is, is, is to go home now. But again, you know, the, the advantage of doing this book over this amount of time was that I saw some of the attitudes change. And I will tell you that in you know, 2006, early 2007, the, there was a large, at least a large minority, if not a majority, who were saying, you know what, we've done what we can. We can't do much more. It's time to go home. But that's changed now. It really has. And I think a lot of them certainly would say, um, I think that I, there's more focus from them on danger from Afghanistan, that, that, that Afghanistan is and always has been the central front of the war on terror. Um, and that Iraq sort of you know, became it, but it, it wasn't when we started. Um, but having given so much and having now seen a possible peaceful, peaceful, stable outcome in Iraq, I mean, I would say actually probably a probable peaceful, stable outcome in Iraq. Um, there's a lot less desire to kind of pack up and go home. Um, but to the other half of your question there, I think, you know, it's hard because people say, you can't, can you support the troops without supporting the war? And the more I talk to them, the more I hear not only can you, but it, that they're really two separate questions and that often opposing a war you know, can be a form of supporting the troops that they're by no means mutually exclusive. So. Hi, thank you so much for coming to, to talk with us. I'm wondering um, you know, how my generation's time compares to the greatest generation and what the perception of that is with the service men and women you talk to. That's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, I, I think the people that I talk to they're in now, they'll speak with reverence, but they'll say what they are doing, okay, two things. One, it's not the whole generation that it's, it's a small group that's actually doing it in terms of the military service. Um, and they'll say, well, actually, Iraq has now gone on far longer than our own involvement in World War II. Um, but beyond that, the way we structure this is that we have them going over for a year, coming back for a year or less, going back again. Whereas World War II, most soldiers, once you went to combat, you were there till the end of the war. And in some ways, that can be more difficult. But the harder thing for them, I think, is coming back, readjusting, you know, going and getting a cup of coffee, and being with your friends and your family and living a normal civilian life, and then going back again. I mean, I was actually uh, on a panel last night with some other, uh, with some, some veterans who brought this point up over and over again. They, um, you know, nobody wants to say, oh, our generation is just as great as, as, as previous ones. But I think in a lot of ways, yeah, absolutely. I think we've asked more of them. And when I, when I heard people tell me that they were getting out of the Army, I mean, at one point I said I was following 24 people, and all 24 were leaning towards getting out of the Army. Now, they didn't all because people grumble as they go along and sometimes they change their mind or for whatever reason. But the reason I heard over and over again was, you know, it's just, it, 
how, much can you, how many times can you ask me to keep going back over and coming back and keep going over and coming back? So I would say that's the biggest comparison. I don't know if that answered your question. <laughs> Thank you. You know, the other thing I was thinking, part of the reason that I, my inspiration for writing this book was a book called The Long Gray Line by Rick Atkinson about uh, West Point's class of 1966. And, you know, talk about a conflict that defined a generation, you know, people that were in the military and weren't. But it, there were very few people who served more than one tour in Vietnam. And where this is actually the norm, I mean, I, 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 did, I did a survey of the class, their attitudes, their experiences, and I found 90% of Pete and his peers went to Iraq or Afghanistan, and more than 50% more, went more than once. And I've talked to some now who've, um, Actually, I guess he's gone now, but a guy who was just leaving on his fifth tour <coughs> in, he's going to Afghanistan this time. Now, he's, he's a volunteer. He's, I, I wouldn't say he, he, he loves it, but he, under, you know, he understands this is what it's going to be for him because of the, the specialty he's chosen. Um, but we've, we've never had a war where we've asked that of people before. And I actually have a hard time going through world history and finding another society that's done the same thing. Well, with that, <laughs> thank you all for coming. I appreciate it being here.